Wow, thank you very much. It's sort of hard to watch that video. I remember missing that kick. That was a long walk to the sidelines. A couple of guys on the uh, sidelines looked at me and said, you got a long walk home from Florida to San Diego after that one. Um, it's hard because it brings back some very powerful memories. Um, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of uncertainty. Um, it's hard to see what we wore back then, what our hairdos were like. Remember those dolphin shorts used to be big. Um, to see your life sort of encapsulated in three minutes. Um, but it, it's a preface for the journey that I, that I have been on that, that actually brings me here in front of you. First, before I get started, I have to tell you, this has been an extraordinary three days for me. Uh, to meet Leanne and Michelle, Perry, the rest of the crew that put this thing on, and the, the passion that's behind this is amazing. I gotta thank uh, Kay from Elsevier and Tom Groom from Health Nexus for introducing me to the group. Extraordinary, extraordinary people. It's interesting though, you know, as I, as I get to know many of you and, and, and all that you do, there's kind of a disconnect for me. Um, you are the nicest people I have ever met. I don't know if you have to pass like a nice gene test to become part of this group, but honestly, you are the nicest people. And the disconnect is many of you are competitors. I mean, I know Walgreens doesn't love CVS who, and others. <laughs> and yet you guys coexist in a way that is remarkable. I think about, you know, could I get the Chargers and the Raiders together in the same room without a fist fight? Or the leadership from the Bears and the Packers? Or the Redskins and the Cowboys? I don't think so. I don't think they could agree on, every, on anything, except maybe that they, they don't like each other. So for me to, to come here and meet all of you and to watch you collaborate and build standards that protect us patients is extraordinary. I, I know it doesn't happen by accident. I think uh, your leadership sets the culture. I love it that you've brought in the dental council, that, that they also treat patients. Together, you guys are making an enormous difference. And, and so let me start by sharing gratitude for all the patients that you touch that you'll never meet whose lives are impacted by what you do. So I'm grateful to be here. Um, I appreciate your willingness to sit through a story that um, is my life, that changed my life. And my hope is that maybe as you reflect on some of the things that I'll bring up, you, you might think how it impacts your own life, your own business, what you do. I was discouraged, I was angry, I was mad, but this was a start. I asked the question, why is this happening? If you've ever been in a tough situation, why is this happening? Let me tell you, why is the wrong question? Why is this endless loop comes back to poor me, I feel sorry for myself, this is not unfair, I can't believe it's happening to me. Nobody wants to hear it. They're tired of it. Yeah, it happened to you. Dude, get on with it. And that's what I began to understand these guys did. Instead of why, the question should be, what now? And where do I go from here? So in the process of changing to what now, I fundamentally had to make a decision at the fork of the road. The fork is to either remain bitter or to choose to get better. Whatever in your life, whatever you're, whatever you're wrestling with, you have a choice to remain where you are, pout and complain and moan, or you can choose to accept where you are and then move forward and in the process become changed. Discover this indomitable spirit that is absolutely in every one of us that gets to change our lives. If you know anything about those, POWs, when they came back, they changed our world. They became CEOs of companies, presidents of companies, senators, congressmen. They changed America. And they will tell you that it was because of that experience in many ways. Now, as I start to recover, Phil Tyne, under my wing, under his wing, starts the recovery process. And all of a sudden, by July, so this is November, I leave the hospital. By July, training camp comes around, and I'm 187 pounds. And he goes, do you think you can kick? I would never thought I would kick again. I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. I go, I don't know. I don't know if the bags will stay on. 
So we bring some ball out to the practice field and we start to kick. And I start to kill it. I mean, I, I'm killing it. I haven't kicked like that in, since I can remember because I'd been sick. And then he goes, I wonder if they'll let you play. Are you kidding me? I have two bags on my side. But maybe I should ask. So I went to the owner of the team. Now, you have to understand, the team was beloved by our community. So when one of the players got sick, there had been a lot of public support. I literally received thousands of letters from people. I mean, it absolutely humbled me what people did for me that didn't know me. So I went to the owner. I said, would you allow me to try out for the team again? And to my surprise, he said, if you can prove to the medical staff that you can protect yourself, we'll let you try out. Go talk to the head coach. So I go to Coach Coriel. Coach, owner said, if I, he goes, hell yeah, Rolf, love to have you back. Yeah, you, of course. So all of a sudden, I get the green light to go back. And I'm thinking, how are we going to do this? So we start, and things start going well, and I'm trying to figure it out. But um, there's some hurdles. I had to figure out how to, how to protect the stomas. And, and I'm competing with another guy. The guy that replaced me hadn't missed inside 50 yards. He looks like he's a linebacker. He's 230 pounds. And I'm going, this is an uphill battle. So we play the preseason. Back there in the four preseason games, the third preseason game. We're playing up in LA when the Rams were still there. And just before the end of the half, we had the ball. It was fourth and 15. It would have been a 55-yard field goal. So Coriel goes, punt team. Now I'm standing next to the special teams coach, and he goes, Rolf, you can kick this, can't you? I said, I can kick this. So the special teams coach goes, field goal team. And the field goal team goes running out there. We're halfway out there, and we hear Coriel say, I said punt team. But it's too late. We're halfway out the field. And we end up making the kick. And it was 55 yards. It was the longest kick in my career. And it was almost like, treat this guy now like a regular player, not as somebody that's been injured. And it allowed me to return and, and gain my job back and um, change my life. Thank you. Some time for a yeah, sure. So we have a few minutes left of this program, and I have to tell you that was quite inspiring, Rolf. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have some questions, so what we're going to do is open it up for Q&A for a bit, and we've got some roving mics going around, and please ask all the questions that you want. So the question was, what we do at work impacts patients a lot. What, what are some, some of the real impactful lessons that we... So here's one of them. Patients feel invisible. They feel unheard. Uh, when you go to a hospital, they talk around you as if you weren't there. And if they talk at all about you, you're a case or a, a disease. You're not a person. And, and, and people are patients, people first and patients second. They have a desire to have humanity. So there's actually a well-known uh, cardiologist in, in San Diego, came out of the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Eric Topol, who wrote two books. The first was The Creative Destruction of Medicine. And what that really is about is, is he's challenges the medical profession. He says, look, you guys will never change. You will never change because it's built into your DNA to keep the data from us, keep the patient away. It's Byzantine the way you run. He goes, the only way it's going to change is if the patients get together and force the change, and that's what's happening. And the way it's happening is maybe not the easiest or the, or the smoothest. Patients come now armed with information. We go to the internet when we're diagnosed with something, and the truth is we may be way misinformed, but we're informed. And we go with that knowledge and interact with our physician and demand that they start to do it. And the, the physicians are pushing back at first. The smart ones are embracing that. The second is we speak with other other patients who are going through the similar things, and we talk with one another. It's interesting, patients now choose hospitals more based on the patient satisfaction ratings than on the physicians. We are consumers. We're going to become better consumers. It's going to become more transparent. Scores are being shared, HCAP scores. Hospitals are being evaluated. Patient satisfaction scores are real. Whether the process is correct or not, it's real. So, we want to be treated like people first, 
and we're not consumers. And consumers have choice. And you can fight it, organizations can fight it, or they can embrace it. And the ones that embrace it are gonna win this disruption that's going on. The second book this guy wrote was, The Patient Will See You Now. The patient will see you now. And we're giving power to the, these patients.